Okay, as promised, I'm going to talk a little bit about chest pain. It's probably next to right upper quadrant pain and epigastric pain. It's one of the most common things we see in the clinical setting. Uh, it's often not what people think it is, but we all, always have to check and make sure. So often people have any type of chest pain. They think they may be having a heart attack. More often than not, it's either musculoskeletal or it's the result of uh, some sort of uh, lower respiratory infection in the lung tract. But sometimes it is for real and it's chest pain and then we need to figure out what's going on. So angina is the word we're gonna start with. No combining form for this one. Um, it is the sudden intense pain or pressure in the chest caused by a reduction of blood flow. Since the heart's not receiving enough oxygen, uh, there's pain present. It's usually due to a narrowing of a coronary artery. It can occur while resting or exercising. And this last statement is somewhat true. It says it can be a warning sign of a heart attack. Now, I have known patients who've had angina and lived to be very old age and never had a heart attack. Um, I mentioned before, arteries can spasm and shut off blood flow. Uh, arteriospasm might be one of the reasons for the angina. And if that's the case, we give you a drug called nitroglycerin. And they come in these little barrel-shaped tablets. They're really tiny. And maybe you've seen people use them before. They'll have chest pain. They'll put one of these under their tongue. And it will dilate those blood vessels within... Well, within a minute or two, probably faster. Nitro works really, really quickly, relieves chest pain if it's angina. So arteriospasm, it's gonna calm that down right away. But let's say you have that, the doctor gives you the nitro and it's not taking away the chest pain. And the, pa the person we're talking about, the patient here with the chest pain, if you look in this drawing, what if one of their coronary arteries looks like that one right there? You can see the plaque on the left of the bifurcation. Uh, in that particular blood vessel. So that might be causing chest pain and a, vaso, uh, a vasodilator, something that's going to open up those, um, those uh, coronary arteries, is not going to help in this situation. Why? Because it's being blocked by plaque and it's causing something called ischemia. So this is based in the combining form ischio, or pardon me, ischio, which is to block or to hold back. Ischemia means you have an insufficient supply of blood to an organ, usually due to a blocked artery. So in this case, uh, we see here, if you look in the, in the little um, portion that's been lifted from this heart and set to the side, you can see a little bulge in the artery there. Well, right there, there's an occlusion, which is another word for a blockage. And behind it, we have arterial blood that's trying to get to its source, but you can see it's blocked right before that bifurcation. The area after that is still is, is filled with venous blood essentially because it's deoxygenated and it can't go anywhere because the flow has been stopped. So you see that kind of darkened area there. If you look back to the left and look at the diagram of the heart, that whole area has gotten dark. And why is that happening? Because the tissue is dying. Necro is a combining form for death as in necrosis, an abnormal condition of tissue death. And when tissue, when tissue has died, it is necrotic. And that's pertaining to the death of tissue. So we see the, the uh, three images here. Image A shows someone um, who kind of has that classic look for the person who could potentially have a heart attack. B is a close-up image of the heart, and you can see there's a blockage there. And C amplifies that blockage so you can see, oh, this is built-up plaque in a coronary artery on the surface of the heart, and it is denying blood supply uh, to its source, uh, or to, to its destination, rather. And so, you know, I'm going to pick on carnitas for a moment. I happen to kind of like carnitas. My apologies to any vegetarians out there. I don't eat it very often because I know it's high in cholesterol, but I do enjoy it. But let's say I have my carnitas burrito and my coronary artery look like that. My last fat molecule that was in my bloodstream came through there and it stuck right to that plaque. You see, plaque, once it gets started, is very sticky. And so molecules like to stick to it. So that last piece of lipid, that last piece of cholesterol coming through, that lovely carnitas burrito I had for lunch, and I've been having shortness of breath and chest pain for a couple years, but I never really looked into it because I thought maybe I was just getting older. You know, this is a very classic story you'll hear patients say. Then all of a sudden, boom, one day that artery gets completely occluded, completely blocked, and there's not lowered blood flow, there's no blood flow. That's necrosis, and we call that in medicine a myocardial infarction. It's abbreviated MI, and it's another word for a heart attack. So look at the word myocardial. We're talking about an infarction of the muscle of the heart. An infarction means basically tissue is dying. So a heart attack. This is death of part of the cardiac muscle tissue resulting from an obstruction of blood supply. 
Usually, one, usually it's one or more of the coronary arteries. I did see a patient once who had chest pain and shortness of breath for a whole weekend, finally came and saw us. The doctor sent him immediately to the emergency room. They worked him up. He had five occlusions in the coronary arteries. He was in surgery for, I think, well over 15 hours, and they placed stents in all of those. Very lucky person that they survived it. Very lucky they had a surgeon. If that person did not change their diet, do something about cholesterol levels and the plaque buildup, they were going to have the same experience a few years later. Don't know how they turned out, but I did witness the front end of it. And um, it's the type of surgery you wouldn't want to have to do. It's not done open heart. They actually insert uh, the tools through the femoral artery in the leg, and they'll come up through the aorta and into the heart, and that's how they place the stem. That's pretty crazy. They used to do it by just cracking the chest open, but they don't do open cardiothoracic surgery that often anymore. Usually they place stents, and as I said, stents are invasive, but they don't require opening up the chest. However, if stent placement's not possible, or if you go back in time 40 years, the most likely thing that's going to resolve the situation I just described, provided that the patient survives it, is called a cabbage, a coronary artery bypass graft. So remember anastomosis? And remember I told you there's sometimes it happens naturally and we want it, and sometimes it happens abnormally and we don't want it, and sometimes it's surgically induced. And this is a form of surgically induced anastomosis. The surgeon removes one or more peripheral veins, often from the leg. So they'll take a piece of vein that, they can, that you can spare, and they'll suture each end of the vein onto the coronary artery or one end, and then they'll route that around the blockage to the other side. And it's like basically like a bypass when there's road construction. They just kind of take you around a different route. So this is one way to go about it, and this will increase the blood flow if it's, if it's successful. The problem is it's open cardiothoracic surgery, which means it's a long recovery, uh, it's dangerous, and once again, if, if things don't change with the cholesterol levels, it's probably just going to be a problem again in the future. Here they show the uh, enlargement of a cholesterol buildup in a coronary artery and what that might look like. So you can see there's kind of fresh lipids or fat running down the middle of it, and it's kind of ringed by plaque. So that's the classic way that it, it, that it will clog eventually. All those fats you eat get in the bloodstream, they're traveling around, there's plaque, plaque is sticky, the fats are sticky, they just keep sticking until they plug it, and then God forbid we have a completely occluded coronary artery. So cabbage is not what you want to have to do, but if it's a life-saving procedure, we'll take it. Okay, well moving from that happy subject of heart attacks, let's go back into the other vessels we should be learning about. Veno is a combining form for vein. Venus means pertaining to the veins. And phlebotomus, now we're approaching your... Uh, job description because we are talking ex exclusively about veins now and no more arteries. And we have two combining forms. Well, actually, there's three. I just gave you veino, and there's also phlebo and veini. So uh, V E N slash can have either an O or an I. Which one do you use? Well, just learn these words the way they are and you'll know. So maybe you've wondered where the term phlebotomy comes from and why we call blood draws uh, act of phlebotomy. It's because it's based on the combining form phlebo. So phlebotomy, uh, and if we recall what tomy means, it's incision of a vein. In this case, to draw blood. Venipuncture is the puncture of a vein. And notice I didn't say surgical because it is not surgical. It's aseptic. We clean it with alcohol and we try not to put any pathogens in there. Uh, but this is not a surgical procedure. And if a vein should happen to get ornery and upset and inflamed, we would call it phlebitis, an inflammation of a vein. That usually happens secondary to a blood clot. So when you do a blood draw, and those of you going the phlebotomy direction, you'll learn how to do this. You'll learn how to palpate. And this can happen on any part of the body for any particular reason, that any clinical reason that we would need to examine. We do it in radiography all the time to find out where bone structures are so we know where to place our, our uh, x-ray beam. Uh, we do it in phlebotomy in order to find out where the vein is. And so to palpate is to examine a part of the body by touch. In this case, they're preparing either to start an IV or to do a blood draw. And so she's palpating. Gen generally speaking, she's going for a particular vein that we usually draw blood from, but it could be for an IV. By the way, I didn't mention this before. If you uh, are hemophobic or for any other reason you think you might pass out when you're doing a blood draw, that's called syncope, the medical term for fainting. If you are prone to that and you happen to be in a chair for a phlebotomist or in a room getting an IV started for a radiological procedure, please let us know you have this reaction. 
because we're going to lay you down and make you very comfortable before we start any work in case you should have that fainting episode while we're doing it. The last thing, and you, those of you who work in medicine or will work in medicine someday uh, will be taught this. The last thing you ever want to do is injure a patient. And one of the major ways they can be injured is by losing consciousness or tripping and falling. So it's the act of falling. And we're trying to prevent it all the time in medicine. As rad techs, we are constantly on top of it, making sure our patient is stable enough to stay on long enough to get the exam done. Okay, now we're going to talk about another pathology here. I won't be able to finish it in this section, but I will finish it in the next one. Uh, just a few slides left, but they cover a lot of ground. Um, we have thrombo, and this is our uh, combining form for thrombus, and a thrombus is a blood clot. There's two types of blood clots we're going to talk about. First one is thrombo. And uh, some of the words derived are thrombogenesis, formation of a blood clot. Thrombolysis is dissolving a blood clot. So that's repairing a blood clot, if you will, getting it out of the way. A thrombectomy is excision of a blood clot. So they may actually do surgery to try to remove it if it's uh, extensive enough and requires it. And thrombophlebitis, and I mentioned phlebitis a moment ago. So thrombophlebitis is more about inflammation of a vein caused by a blood clot. And you'll notice here in the diagram, they're circling a particular vein that's in the posterior knee. It's called the popliteal vein. And the region they're indicating is called the popliteal region. And it's posterior leg exactly at the crease where um, behind your kneecap. And they point that out because that's a frequent place where thrombi or a thrombus, meaning a stationary blood clot, might form. So it attaches to the interior wall of a vein or artery, and it frequently causes obstruction. So we talked about, you know, the artery, arteries carrying blood out to the body, and they have muscles that help control that. But when your body has to return blood to the heart, think about this. I mean, you're standing, and it's forcing blood all the way down your leg to the tips of your toes. Now that blood's got to get all the way back up your body and back into the heart. Getting there is pretty easy. You've got the pressure of the heart and you have gravity pulling it that way. Now it has to fight gravity to get back up to your heart. And blood pressure is how it does it. So the pressure exerted in the arteries automatically transfers to the veins and forces that blood back up. Along the way, much like the valves you have in your heart, you have valves like you see in this picture of the vein. That helps resist gravity. So with each pumping of the heart, the blood pushes up and it shunts to the next valve. The valve closes. The next beat will shunt it up to the next gate and it closes and so on and so forth. Sometimes those gates will get a sticky piece of, uh, or a sticky red blood cell or something, or for some reason a blood uh, clot will start to form. This particularly happens in flights. If you're up, you know, at 35,000 feet or whatever level they fly at, and you've been sitting for 12 hours and you haven't gotten, moved, gotten up and moved around, your risk of forming a blood clot is really strong. When you fly, anytime, you should try to get up and move around at least once an hour, if, if just for a walk up and down the aisle. That is, if we ever get on a plane again in the COVID world. Um, but you should keep moving because that keeps the blood flow going. And moving this part is, is, is needed to get that blood to move back to the heart. If you don't, and a thrombus should happen to form there, you end up with potentially a deep vein thrombosis, otherwise known as a DVT. So this is the formation of a blood clot deep in a deep vein of the body. Almost always happens in the popliteal region, so that I showed you back here behind the posterior knee. One of the hallmarks is that, and it shows it here on the far right, the calf will swell, erythema will be there, uh, there'll be some edema there, leg warmth, and it's going to kind of look like an infection. And you'll also be able to distinguish it because if you have the patient display both calves, one will look normal and one will look red and swollen and maybe even twice the size of the other. That could be some type of infection, so you have to be careful to not, uh, you know, make too many assumptions before you know, but it also could be a DVT. DVTs are important. We need to know about them. We need to fix them if we can. Um, Thrombolysis, of course, would be the technique they would use, some sort of agent or maybe surgery to remove it. Uh, and generally speaking, it needs medical attention, preferably more now than later. Uh, it's usually not an emergency if it's just a straight DVT. Um, if you happen to get one and it's the result of maybe AFib, you know, you may come in with this blood clot and come out on medications and find out you have a heart condition as well. Uh, or you might have just got random and it threw a clot. Either way, a DVT does require medical attention, and it's not extremely emergent, but within 24 to 48 hours. I'll be back in one moment, and we'll finish this lecture off.